What is Latin? Now, those of you who know that I have a Latin language YouTube channel are probably like, Luke, if you don't know what Latin is, that's alarming. <laughs> well, actually, it's a very important question because you may know that I do speak Latin every day with many people around the world. It is a language that we use sometimes exclusively without having to resort to vernacular languages like English or Italian or what have you. So Latin is, of course, a language that uh, I would call it living. I have a video about that, which I've done before. A language that is certainly alive in the sense that it's used by people on a regular basis, certainly myself included. And that means something because well, what is the language that we are using exactly? Because we can talk about the passage of time, and here we have a timeline I have drawn up. Here we see the legendary founding of Rome in 753 BC, the year zero, or year one. I know it's supposed to be year one, I'm just calling it zero. And then there's a thousand, and there's a present day 2000. And there are different aetates, different ages here that we'll, that we'll talk about. So while the Romance languages, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Romanian, among others, are descended from Latin, from some version of Latin, we say that it's from the vulgar Latin, from vulgar Latin, here I'll make a note of the vulgar Latin. Vulgar Latin comes from the word vulgus, vulgus, which is cognate with the English uh, in German word of the same pronunciation, folk, or folk in German with a V, and it means the people. So vulgar Latin is the people's language. And this stands in contrast with what is called classical Latin, which occurs roughly between the years 75 BC and 200 AD. So let's explore the origins of Latin. Latin is descended from Proto-Italic, Italic referring to Italy, the languages that were variously spoken throughout Italy. And the Latin, when we speak of Latin, we're speaking specifically of the urbane, of the urban dialect of Latin spoken by educated elites in this time period. And that stands in contrast with various forms of more rustic Latin, which I'll also write over here. Rustic Latin could happen at any period, but authors, classical authors, authors, classical authors, well, educated authors of the classical Latin period will refer to rustic forms of Latin. Latin from other parts of Latium, Latium. Rome became the dominant city in the region of Latium, or today it's called Lazio in Italy. We could still call it Latium in English, or Latium. So rustic Latin could be that form, or it could be anything of the vulgar Latin, the people's Latin, the non-educated variant throughout Italy and ultimately throughout the Roman Empire. So Proto-Indo-European branches into Proto-Italic, and then there is some version of Proto-Latin we can imagine that maybe was and certainly something was spoken by these legendary founders or whoever they were who started to begin the uh, city, the town, and then the city of Rome. And in this period, before the year 75 BC, certainly before uh, the beginning of the first century BC, all of this is referred to as Old Latin. There is no strict beginning of when Old Latin began because we don't have very much in the way of testimony there. We just have inscriptions that variously appear around here, around this century. But finally, the first real Latin literature happens after the, the birth of uh, Plautus, or Plautus. He uh, was born in 254 and died in 184, according to, um, according to the ancient uh, Roman sources. So I'm going to write Plautus here. And also here, the dates of his birth and death are not clear between 190 and 160, and those are for Terentius or Terence. And they were partially contemporaries, living around the beginning of the first century BC, or excuse me, around the beginning of the second century BC, I, I mean, the uh, 190s, we'll say, somewhere around there. To those of us who have studied classical Latin, such as through the wonderful book Familia Romana, Lingua Latina per se illustrata, which it has actually an accompanying text, which is for one of Plautus's plays, which is called the Amphitrio. 
And that, even though it's much, it's considerably older, it's from about 200 BC, and yet the Latin I learned was something more like from around here, roughly, it was completely understandable. The new vocabulary and the usages of, of grammar that were slightly different weren't that different at all. To me, until I learned that Plautus and Terence were old Latin and not classical Latin, that they were something other than the language I really studied, I was surprised because the differences between uh, Plautus and Terence and the Latin I had come to study at that point were so minor as uh, to be uh, hardly noticeable. I'd probably say there's a greater difference between the author Jane Austen and, uh, I don't know, a modern 20th century author. It, and we, no one would consider Jane Austen to have written in a language different from ours today, despite the variations of English that exist around the world and throughout time. In any case, Plotus and Terence are essentially the beginning of Latin literature. And then you have um, uh, Ennius and uh, many others who come in, in this come in during this period, Cato the Elder and so forth. But the, none of it is, is quite the classical variant yet. Classical Latin has two major periods that it's divided into. And the first one, going from about 70 BC to 1880, I've looked up these numbers and the, the exact definitions of them may vary from scholar to scholar. But in any case, this is called the Golden Age of Latin. And the Golden Age uh, Latin has quite famous, perhaps the most famous authors of Latin, which we can name Cicero and Caesar. And I specifically name the two of them because when we talk about learning this Latin language, this is the form that we seem to study. And what's happened in the years as they've gone by is that people have imitated Caesar and especially Cicero as the model of Latin through the rest of time to the present day. And that's very interesting. That's what has standardized the Latin language throughout time. That's why the Latin that we speak today is essentially the same language as that of Cicero and not necessarily the same as that of Plautus. Golden Age Latin is followed by Silver Age Latin and the Silver Age goes from about the year 18 AD to 133. And the boundaries of classical Latin seem to go a little bit, teens a bit earlier and later to something like 200 AD apparently. So these dates I think are somewhat arbitrary. But if you know exactly why these dates are so specific, what they refer to, why there's a distinction here, some say 133 for the end of the Silver Age and yet classical Latin proceeds a little bit longer, I'd love to know. But um, I think it's, it's, these are not terribly well fixed periods of time. So the Silver Age has famous authors like Seneca, just to give some idea of these authors. Now, for me, of course, reading the Latin of Seneca or Juvenal is not a terribly different experience than reading that of Cicero or Caesar or of the many other poets. To me, it just seems like the wider variety of different of different authors. And there's stylistic variations and things, but this has a huge impact on what we compose, because those, those of us who speak Latin, some of us even write in Latin, or even write books in Latin. And we all concentrate on this golden age, Cicero in particular, certainly for prose, as our primary style guide. And as I mentioned before, contemporary at all times, while we have a literary language that has its roots here, this literary language, which is interesting, of the old Latin variety of Plautus and Terence, which, as I said, is remarkably similar to the classical Latin, it's not that different, has a lot of the vulgus, a lot of the Latina vulgaris in it. Things that are either eschewed or not found in these authors during the Golden Age or the Silver Age. And yet, around the same time period, we can find works of a uh, lesser importance, for example, for example, the Interpretamenta, which come from the mid second century AD, which have how to have a conversation in Latin. And yet they have expressions, which we don't find here, expressions that, in fact, I have dared to use before. And people have said, oh, that's not good Latin. And they have a point, and I don't disagree with them necessarily. I was using them because they are colloquial and they had something in common with these guys back here. So 
what I'm getting at, and this is not a, an extremely coherent presentation, but what I'm getting at and wondering about through this whole process here is, okay, so this Latin that we speak today is based here, but is this all that it can be? Do we think that Juvenal and Seneca are less Latin to some degree? And some people might say yes. And I don't think they're necessarily wrong either. These are really just the questions that we have, because as we continue to speak and cultivate Latin as what I call a living language, that is a language that is used for communication in the form of books, conversation, music, you name it. As this continues in our 21st century, we have to make certain decisions, editorial decisions, artistic decisions. So moving on, after the classical Latin period, which, as I read, ends at around 200 BC, but feel free to add your comments about these boundaries if you have them. So classical Latin, but the Roman Empire is still going until about this year, about 475 AD. The whole fall of the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire continues, which be, uh, comes to be called Byzantium, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and goes for another thousand years up until way, way, up, uh, way up here, as I recall. And in that uh, whole time, the Byzantine Empire is speaking mostly Koine, well, actually Byzantine Greek. An interesting theme that is worth mentioning that isn't entirely going to be clear from my presentation is that although we concentrate on the, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 or so authors, 25 to 50 authors, some of whom are really famous, like these four gentlemen, and others which I haven't mentioned, Ovid, Horace, uh, Catullus, uh, Sallus, so many are there and they have so many works that are one could spend a lifetime on practically one author and enjoy all of that and make a whole scholarship out of that. So that said, though, these works, although they're seen as a gold standard, especially and then Cicero followed by Caesar, the works that follow after this period increase dramatically. If we look at all the works of Latin literature, it's a, it is much less than 10%. I think it's been 2 and 5% or actually what we call classical Latin period as far as the ages when uh, the words were written down when they were first composed. That is, most of the Latin that exists out there is from after, and quite a huge amount from the Renaissance, which we'll get to later. So let's label some of these others. After the classical Latin period, the term used is late Latin, which is a reasonably arbitrary term. Of course, all of these are uh, late Latin. So late Latin. Uh, which goes until, and I've seen it in two different uh, definitions, one around closer to the end of uh, 700, and then uh, around 800 AD, apparently in, in uh, the um, Iberian Peninsula, in, in Hispania, you have late Latin continuing, but you have medieval Latin, which follows in the next period, starting sooner. What that means exactly is a matter of style, and as I'm not especially well-versed, in text from either period, not to say I'm well-versed in text of the classical period either. I'm not exactly sure what those distinctions are, but I think there's some debate there. Feel free to put your comments below. With respect to late Latin, to give us at least one author from this period that uh, might be uh, reasonably well-known, we have a couple. We have around the late 300s, we have St. Jerome translating the Vulgate Bible which is the standard Latin form of the Bible to this day. And some years after that, we have St. Augustine, who wrote his Confessions, among many other things. And, okay, so this is definitely the Latin, which is not classical Latin. But as a reader and speaker of classical Latin, when I look at these works, I find them easy to understand. I see things in there that look like, oh, are those grammatical mistakes, maybe? Are those things, words that are somehow more vulgar, that is more of the common people, less part of the classical tradition. A little bit. I, I can notice a little bit of that, but again, I'm not that well-versed in these texts. Nevertheless, they are part of the continuum, the unbroken continuity of Latin being a spoken and written language for over two and a half thousand years. So after late Latin comes the period that's called medieval Latin, and some writers in that period we have around the year 1100, we have Eloise and 
her consort, the philosopher Abelard, Abelard. And so they're around this uh, period. Later in medieval Latin, we have Aquinas. And then after medieval Latin will come Renaissance Latin. And Renaissance Latin is, in Latin we call it the, uh, the Renatae uh, Artes, the arts reborn, the skills reborn. So let's try it. Renaissance, Renaissance Latin. And as you may uh, recall from history classes, it's called the Renaissance because it is the rebirth of this stuff. And it is the rebirth of philosophy, science, uh, the uh, ancient technologies, all sorts of things, medicine. And it is, the re is a rebirth because of the instrument of Latin and also ancient Greek being studied again from specifically this ancient period. So almost 15, you know, a thousand years later, basically, is when we start seeing this this rebirth. And these authors, they start cultivating with extreme precision Cicero and other ancient authors, such that works of Erasmus, whose name I'm going to uh, write, write about here at this time period, Erasmus of Rotterdam, and then Petrarch. Petrarch is, of course, most famous, I think, uh, as an international and historical figure for being the second very prominent author after Dante to write in Italian. Well, that is the art language of Italy, which eventually becomes the basis of standard Italian much, uh, much later. What's ironic is that Petrarch thought that, although he enjoyed dabbling in what we call Italian at the time, he thought that Latin was the superior language for poetry and for literature in general. <laughs> so uh, that's very interesting. And he actually lived a little bit earlier over in, in 1300, but it's, you get the idea more or less of where uh, these, these gentlemen line up in history and ladies, because there are some important female authors here as well, which we should remember and read. They are worthy authors. The boundaries here, of course, fuzzy, but the end of Renaissance Latin, I'll say today that it ends about the year 1600. And after that, we have Neo-Latin or New Latin. Sometimes we refer to the Romance languages as Latin languages, and these terms are all kind of fuzzy and not terribly clear. So there's nothing wrong with that exactly. But um, when we speak of New Latin in the literature sense, that's where it belongs. It's almost like talking about modernism and postmodernism in the art world. It's like, what? How can we be postmodern if modern means today? But it doesn't matter. <laughs> One of my favorite authors from this period is Isaac Newton. And there's others like uh, Kepler and Copernicus, which are all around this period, which is on this transition between Renaissance and New Latin. Now, all of these authors from the Renaissance period on have caused the rebirth of the classical language mores such that they have imitated it so well, like Erasmus, for example, such that we can today, if we're looking for gold standards of Latin, look to both Cicero and to Erasmus, I would say with equal admiration and esteem. And if I'm wrong about that, then I would love to hear your opinion. So Erasmus and Cicero are our guys. Like if we have to say this is absolutely Latin and there can be no doubt that it is an acceptable version, Cicero and Erasmus separated by a huge amount of time here, as you can see. That's what's so wonderful about speaking this language today. We have this connection with people from the just a few hundred years ago who were writing and speaking in this language, giving speeches in it, giving talks in it all the way through the uh, medieval and the late Latin period, all the way to classical Latin and before, we can experience the plays of Plautus, we can experience these comedies and enjoy them, I think, with a, a similar amount of enjoyment that anybody from any period who also spoke Latin could have enjoyed them. Uh, the jokes, I think, are just as funny today as they ever were. At least that's my, my opinion. So after the new Latin period, we get to the... 20th century and on to the current 20th century. And we just call this contemporary 
contemporary, I can spell English, yay, contemporary Latin. And contemporary Latin, New Latin, Renaissance Latin, all of the best authors here are looking back at the classical Latin. I use this color scheme deliberately, the classical being uh, this golden color, the Renaissance being golden to associate it with it because they are closely related, and then the New Latin, the contemporary Latin. Part of this discussion also leads into a standard pronunciation system. Uh, that is to say, what form of Latin should we use as far as pronunciation? Uh, as you know, I tend to espouse and mostly speak in a classical Latin pronunciation based on the first century BC, and the Calabrese system, I believe, is the most ideal and correct for that time period. As a sort of international standard, others espouse the standard Italian, or traditional, I should say, Italian pronunciation of Latin because of its association with certain Renaissance humanists, namely Petrarch and others, from uh, this period. And that's for the next video, we'll talk about that interesting debate. So I asked the question, what again? What is Latin? Because we see words, terminology, uh, works that don't have the same style as these guys in these periods, or here in medieval Latin. Or certainly we could see them in Renaissance Latin, or Neo Latin, or other contemporary Latin. We might see innovations in any of these periods by different authors which fall below what we might consider to be something as a true or standard language. Now, we have vulgar Latin making its appearance in these literary old Latin forms, and we also see vulgar Latin in places here in classical Latin. We see, we see this language, the seeds of which are going to become the Romance languages throughout Europe, planted here. And thus, the classical Latin, which is, again, what we're seeming to, aiming, seeming to be aiming for, the classical Latin and Renaissance Latin and so forth are mostly distinguished, a distinguish, um, are mostly a characteristic of time period, not necessarily of style. The stylistic variations can be noted. Christianity obviously becomes a thing around here. So we have Christian language and terms translated from Koine Greek and Hebrew, which enter Latin, and they remain to some degree. But the Latin of the Renaissance mostly undoes a lot of the medievalisms and the late Latin barbarisms, as some people call them. Those things are removed by authors here. So in all, we have a tradition that from our contemporary Latin from 2019, going certainly back to Erasmus earlier, to Petrarch, is completely unbroken as the idea of really restoring a classical style. But also through here, it's not broken either. It's just altered, added to, and it depends on the competence of the author. Now, part of this comes down to the fact that at some point in here, we lose native speakers of Latin. Now, what that means is being a native speaker is an interesting question, because at some point there comes a diglossia, Greek for meaning two tongues, having two languages. And that occurs somewhere. Now, in reality, uh, true or partial diglossia is a part of speakers of every language. Right now, I'm speaking to you in a reasonably formal form of English, but if I fight like, maybe I'm gonna talk to you more, more slangy. I'll use words like gonna or wanna. And if I want to, I can, and maybe I could do so to make a point. And those forms of language do appear that is to say, more of the vulgar Latin, more of the peoples or common Latin, non-literary, non-formal types, informal Latin, you might say, appears everywhere from the old Latin period through the, through, uh, the 900 AD and, and further. So ultimately, what I want to know, because this is a very practical question, as a speaker of contemporary Latin, or rather a speaker of Latin who lives in the contemporary Latin period, we have access to enormously rich literature. We can read something by Heloise Abelard, Hildegard, who I haven't written here, and others. What if we see words in there which are either not found or which have a strange etymology or which we can say, no, oh, we're not sure. Is this like a good Latin word if we see them used by here? These are real Latin authors. Can we then say that their Latin is lesser than something we could produce? I don't, this is, these are not rhetorical questions. These are questions which I don't have, I think, an easy answer. And they're very important to ask. I, in particular, would like to invite 
uh, off the top of my head, certain people like Patrick Owens, Nancy Llewellyn, Daniel Pedersen, people whom I know to have extremely good Latin style, but also have different opinions on this. For example, Patrick Owens, if you happen to be watching, I know that your usage of Latin and your interests are golden age through and through. And your pre-production of Latin is extremely consistent with exactly this. And that's, and you espouse this as our, our center and with, uh, for good reason. This is most definably and most easily said to be the Latin. In fact, there's another term we should introduce at this point, which is Latinitas. Latinitas. And I'll put it right here next to rest in Latin. So Latinity, which we call Latinitas. Get those long vowels on there. Latinitas is the good Latin style. As I was saying, uh, Patrick Owens, again, if you're watching, your Latinitas is above reproach. And all of us want to be able to achieve that, that kind of a goal. Uh, and there are, for example, Daniel Pedersen, again, uh, you, sir, if you're watching, we love your Latin and everything you produce and how classical it is. And you advise us, for example, you advise us on how to say, um, uh, don't worry about it. The term that was often used by in this kind of new Latin period of noli soliquitari as not being a particularly classical expression. In fact, indeed, you found uh, Plautine and, uh, and Terence expressions, uh, aliud cura and sine cura sis, which are much more, I think, and I agree with you completely, much more Latin. They could definitely be more Latin than something like noli soliquitari, which may be a phrase just invented in this period, maybe even this period, which isn't equally valid. But here's my question for you then. If it's not from this period, if it's from this, if it's from old Latin, because this is truly Latin, there's no doubt. This literature is the Latin. This is apparently slightly lesser, but usually, yeah, it's still Latin. Can we, and this is elderly legible to us, can we use these phrases? Can we say extemplo? Is that allowed? Extemplo being a phrase which um, is similar to subito and others which are found more with greater currency in, the, in this period. So not only that, but we find very useful phrases in late Latin period. We have these religious terms. We have um, the author Emilio Springhetti, who's very Ciceronian himself, says that we permit certain religious terms like inspiratio, in, which is for inspiration, in contrast with aflatus, animi, with the, um, as a proper term for inspiration, which is more consistent with this language. So it's a fascinating conundrum. Um, I have friends who are linguistics and they take the normal approach of descriptive uh, language, descriptive linguistics, that is to say, how the language is, is simply how it is. And that's what we describe. And then there's the prescriptivist side, which is, this is how the language should be. There is elements of both in every language. For example, in English, we can say, oh, it's proper to use whom after a preposition, but not a lot of people do that. And that's an interesting question. So do we, do we continue to reinforce these rules as proper style of English? And people will, and I think whom will exist as a part of proper English among at least the most educated for a, the indefinite future. Well, similarly, we have, what's interesting is English is a very common language, a very vulgaris language spoken by many, many peoples as far as pronunciation. I mean, there's two dominant standards in the world being the RP of the UK and the general American of uh, obviously the United States. And then there are other varieties in there which are standard the standard Australian. There are many other versions uh, which can be found in Ireland, Scotland, New Zealand, India, and all have a certain degree of validity. And that's an interesting question too about pronunciation, which I'll talk about in the next video. Latin, having been fossilized in this period, of course, that's extremely interesting and rather unique. The situation is not like that with ancient Greek. It's been fossilized in a way here, or rather it's been standardized. And that standard language is what we teach in schools. It's what we learn today. It's what we speak. Oh, as for diglossia, true diglossia would be in the case of certain people in Italy, for example, 
where they still speak what's called a dialetto, a dialect, which truly its own language, that is similar to standard Italian, and they can switch between them. Uh, that's where there's truly the, uh, two languages at the same time, one that's more common and one that's more standardized. The young people of Italy today mostly are not learning their dialects, the dialetti, which I think is a shame because they're very rich and very beautiful and very interesting, and hopefully that heritage is continued. I called out, if you will, Daniel Pedersen and Patrick Owens to share their opinions in the comments section below. I also mentioned Nancy Llewellyn, who is uh, very interested, as many of us are, in medieval Latin and uh, Renaissance Latin, Latin of the post-classical period. And I would like to know also what you think about this situation. When we have at our disposal the richness of authors from these periods, because most of Latin is written here. Not here, although this is, a, as always, the gold standard for it and what everything after is based on. Why ought we not to be able to write or use words like coruscatio, one of Hildegard's uh, words, or other terms that are of a late or medieval or even Renaissance character or even new Latin character or contemporary Latin character? Words we have, of course, invent as necessary neologisms for uh, Facebook and tweeting and all these things in Latin, and they're, they're great. If you're interested, I have a list of ones I've been collecting on my scorpiomartianus.com website. So when we have authors like Foster or even Egger, Egger, Latinist for the Vatican in the 20th century, again, some of the best Latin that there is. Is his Latin not really Latin? Now, there are some people out there, and I would be happy to hear from you, who are academics who consider that the continuation of Latin after Erasmus by, I assume, Newton and, and others to be some kind of not real Latin, but that's, of course, well, to me, it seems very spurious. But if you have that opinion, why what we speak today in Latin, <clears throat> the videos that we make, the podcasts that we do, the conversations that we have, the schools schools that we teach, the classes that we teach, and so forth, that all that is apparently not real Latin, well, okay, you're gonna have to, I would love to hear your justification for it. I'm not, obviously, uh, it's, it's contrary to reality in the extreme, as I've demonstrated with other videos on this channel and my other Latin channel. Latin is what I consider to be a language that is a live, and my definition is the fact that it's used by people to communicate, and that's my definition for it. It's not something like, say, ancient Egyptian, which, as far as I know, is not used by people too often when they're drinking coffee, whereas Latin is with increasing frequency. Of course, whether or not a language is alive or dead, whatever those terms even mean, which uh, some might define dead as being language is not changing anymore. Well, I don't see that as very, as, I don't, that makes sense to say that Latin is dead because it was fossilized here. It was preserved and standardized and never changed. Well, that could be said of any language where it's been standardized. French is a great example where it's changed very little in the standard way, whatever the Académie permits as the years go by. Latin is just a very extreme, very severe example of standardization, but not impervious, nor ought it to be, because otherwise we couldn't have contemporary Latin where we're talking about whatever terms we want, or where Isaac Newton is coming up with terms to, to discuss gravitation and the forces of nature, like inertia, for example, which most of us today, it's interesting, the term inertia in English, we use it and we think of it often, I think, in the physics sense, having inertia. We especially think of it in one of its senses that a motion, that an object in motion continues to have that motion. It continues in that direction unless it's stopped by friction or some other force. But inertia really just means the lack of doing things. So inertia in that sense has a double meaning Thanks to Newton, whereas it's more classical meaning, meaning is more fixed, a fascinating example of how the language has been able, per permitted to spread, to change just a little bit. And there's no doubt that Newton is writing in Latin, that Edgar is writing in Latin, that we are speaking as best as we can Latin today in the 21st century. So that concludes my presentation what is Latin? And ultimately, what that question is, what is the standard form of Latin we should teach, permit for ourselves, 
And teaching is a big part. Much of the living Latin movement, as it's often called, revolves around education. But we are starting to see the changes. I made a video about the culture of Latin speakers, where we are producing many things, podcasts, videos, books, for our own consumption, which is exactly comparable to Latin in all these periods, certainly the Renaissance and uh, New Latin period, and with this uh, new Renaissance, as Christoph Rico uh, calls it, yet another new Renaissance that we have now, where we're able to recapture these ancient languages so well. What's interesting is thanks to technology, of course, we can communicate with each other over long distances on regular, on a regular basis, even though our numbers of speakers in the thousands or tens of thousands are relatively few. We can find each other, we can speak with each other, and we can enjoy this all this literature, and we can communicate with each other. So what, again, the question for all of you, and I would hope uh, you write your responses below, um, no opinions are invalid here. Uh, as I mentioned, I decided to mention three names, Patrick Owens and Nancy Llewellyn and Daniel Pedersen, as uh, being, I think, interesting exemplars of Latin generally being used today because all of you speak Latin with immense facility and you are our models. What should we do? What kind of words uh, do we use? Do And uh, speaking of Patrick Owens, he made this really good point in his article. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was basically if we come up with various neologisms, if we start creating a kind of new romance language where we start to diverge too much from the tradition, of Latin. Then, if we go back into reading something from this period, which is often our goal, uh, to speak Latin. Well, you know, why do we speak Latin? Of course, we enjoy it as, as a hobby in itself, but uh, we speak the Latin because we want to have the ability to access this literature with complete facility, without any Difficulty, and without any more difficulty than, say, an American who has studied Italian being able to read the Italian Petrarch or Italian Dante. And he has a really good point about that, which is worth considering, very much worth considering. Jesse Kraft and I, in our most recent podcast, which is contemporary with uh, the release of this video, discussed this question as well. And also on Jesse Kraft's channel, Magister Kraft. He has an interview in English with one of his former pro uh, professors, and the series is called Classical Reflections, where he discusses color terms. And he asks the question, what do we teach our students if they want to know, especially in the context of the so-called Living Latin Movement, what do we teach our students when it comes to if, teaching them what's the word for pink or orange? And then uh, the gentleman's response was a very good one. Well. Some cultures don't have certain color terms. They're not there. Japanese, for example, would consider the primary word for these two colors as being ao, which means blue or green, or something in between. And they do have ways of distinguishing them. They can, they can call uh, blue today in Japan, buru from English, and they call green midori, which means something like fresh uh, growing plant, or it has its etymology with that idea. So they have ways of distinguishing them that they acquired under the influence of foreign culture, Western culture in particular. So if the Romans didn't have certain color terms, yet for us as speakers of European languages, myself an American, I know what pink and orange are distinctly. Should I come up with a different term? What do we do? And we have words. Now, it's interesting is we do have words that exist. We have color terms that have been developed in these periods. And those color terms correspond pretty well with our modern languages, color terms, say in English, Italian, French, etc. But they don't exist back here. Is it okay to use them? Is that acceptable? When is it, when are we going too far? So this is, a, I think, a very interesting debate, and I hope to have responses from all kinds of people in this uh, video. Maybe you're interested in Latin and are just finding out, oh, Latin's a living language? Oh, I don't know that. Or at least Latin's a language that people use to speak um, every day, which is true, especially for myself. There are podcasts in Latin. There's videos in Latin. Yes, there's uh, links to a bunch of that in the description of this video. And I mentioned Daniel Pedersen and Patrick Owens and Nancy Llewellyn specifically because I think the three of you stand on slightly different parts 
of this debate. But not only you, guests whom we've had on the podcast Legio Tertia Decima, 13th Legion, like Alexis Helmer, uh, Roberto Carfagni, your opinions also. I enormously esteem your Latin style, so I would love to hear from you as well. But everyone, everyone who has an interest in the Latin language, whether as a living instrument or not, I would like to hear what you have to say, especially if you have any corrections to my, my history or my assessment of the situation with Latin. Thanks so much. Tune in for part two, where I ask the question of, what is the standard pronunciation of Latin? What should it be, if there should be one, and why? Thanks again. Valete. Debamus amore facilis